Turn your Bibles. I'll uh, do this. Uh, James chapter 5. Put a marker there. James chapter 5. And then we'll turn to Philippians chapter 3. Thank you for staying. You that weren't going to stay, I'm glad you did stay. For those who didn't stay, well, I'm quite angry with them. But <laughs> no, that's uh, the Lord knows all about that. He knows uh, who's here and who this is going to be life-changing for you, and which of you that uh, it's going to be a help to you. It might not be life-changing, but there will be some of you, if you will be obedient to the Spirit, not to me, uh, I guarantee you it has potential to be life-changing. I'm grateful for God's grace. We've been blessed. I'm thankful for the work that New Testament Baptist Church and the helpers, other churches, uh, to do this for us. It's, it takes effort. It doesn't just happen. And I appreciate all the effort in that. And then you guys that gave to an offering, thank you for doing that. Uh, it does, it's expensive to do this. I would have never guessed it's almost $40,000 because uh, it only cost about twelve to $15 to get me here. I don't know why cost so much. No, uh, I do. I have a large, uh, when I ask for, when people ask me to come, it's quite expensive. If they want me to come, they're willing to pay. So <laughs> you know, I've, I've only been asked two times in 40 years of ministry, uh, how much do you charge? And I said, nothing. Just whatever God tells you to do, I'll be there. And I'm glad for God's goodness to me. Anyway, did I tell you Philippians chapter 3 already? All right, if you are able, if you'd stand with me, please. Just because I want to remind you, I'm going to read this verse to you that the Apostle Paul said. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. That's a reality of humanity. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation our citizenship, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Wow. Wow. Now, if you go to James 5, where your ribbon is, if you'll just leave your ribbon there when I get to preaching, I'm, we're not going to turn to any other passage than James. And so I'll show you some verses in James in a little while at the conclusion. But uh, I want to show you this one to begin with. James 5, 16. 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another, that you may be healed. Oh, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Isn't that who you want to be praying for you? A person that's doing their utmost to live righteously? A preacher just preached about having a righteous family. All those things are there. That's the kind of people I want praying for me. And uh, Brother Folger just told me, him and his wife Denise, Pray for me and Nancy. We're on his prayer schedule, and every week they mention her name before God. And that's a blessing to me. I want someone like him praying for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's have prayer and see what God's going to do to our hearts right now. Our great God, I come to you again. I sure love you. I thank you so much for what you've done in me and to me. And I give you glory for anything you've done with me. But God, I'm privileged to stand again to try to get across truth 
And God, I believe it would bring honor and glory to You if us men would agree with You and believe You. I pray we'd do that today. We certainly love You, Jesus, and we surely, surely look forward to when we get to see You. It's in Your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our humanity loves dopamine. Okay, wait a minute. I spent like 40 minutes on this this morning. Okay, I'm going to give you a chance to say amen out loud. Wait, 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 wait. Our humanity loves the dopamine rush. We are drunk. We are intoxicated. We are controlled by the euphoria. The feeling, the release, the expectation, the thrill. Many of us recognize Jesus as our Savior. Hallelujah, I'm grateful, but wait, 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 wait. We need to take the next step and continue to recognize Him as our solution. He's the Savior, yes, but He is the solution also. God has saved us from our sins. His grace covers us. God's grace also wants to change us into His image. That's called sanctification. That's called transformation. God wants to transform us into the likeness of His dear Son. One day, one day when we see Him, we shall be like Him. But on our journey, we're supposed to be becoming like Him. Let Him change us. So how does Jesus become our solution? At the cross, Jesus died unto sin once. Sin, therefore, watch, it has no moral, and has no more moral authority over any of us. We died with him. We also are supposed to be dead to sin. Somebody say amen. amen. The penalty has been paid. Justice has been satisfied. We are free from the penalty of sin. Praise his name. Romans 6, it says, Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The only way you can walk in newness of life is if you're born again. You must be born again. You must be saved. The newness of life is the life of Christ in us. So the Scripture says, Yield yourselves unto God. For sin hath no dominion over you. Men, once we get saved, the reality is we do not have to waller in sin. You don't have to. Well, Brother Dave, everybody sins. Everybody has to sin every day. No, you don't. You don't have to. We've been delivered from that. We have freedom and victory in Christ. Many of us, though, are enslaved by self and by sin. One John, I just I read it to you, I think we said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Say amen. amen. No, 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 you're not, you're not getting it. I'm, maybe I'm not getting it across. If we say we have no sin, he's talking to believers. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And we know that, we believe that, we practice that. And here's what I want to say to you now. We also waller in it. We go, well, I don't have a chance. He says I'm going to sin. He says if I say I have no sin, I'm, de I'm deceiving myself. I know what I'm like. I do not, I do not have a chance. And we waller in our sin, saying it's just no use. Hey, Bubba, 
That's verse 8. Verse 9 is in the Bible too. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Men, I'm telling you, even though we are sinners, he wants to forgive us and he will, he will, he will, if we'll confess it. Amen. Don't waller in your sin and say, well, I don't have a chance. It's just no help for me. Oh, no, we have a chance. Praise his name. There's nothing that can bind us. Verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not some sin, not a particular sin, not a sin of us, not so bad. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's nothing he cannot cleanse me from. It's a lie of the devil to say, Well, I don't have a chance. And, I've asked him a hundred times to cleanse me, to forgive me. It's not working, and I'm just giving up. No, 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 you're swallowing the lie of the devil. Believe the truth of Jesus. Believe the truth of God. As long as long as we try to fight the problem with our own strength and willpower, we will lose. Jesus says it plainly. It's in red letters. Without me, ye can do Nothing. See, Satan can get around our willpower anytime. But he cannot get around what happened at Calvary. No, I want to say that again. He cannot get around what happened at Calvary. Blessed be God, I'm going to say it out loud. Amen. Mercy. I can trust that Jesus' blood, I can't believe I'm going to say this word out loud. I can trust that Jesus' blood is efficacious. I have no idea what it means, but it sounds good, baby. <laughs> Jesus' blood is still effective today. Still valuable today. It has great value if you and I would be willing to appropriate it to appropriate it. The only people that ask for forgiveness and ask for Jesus to cleanse him are people that want to know him. Amen. It's available. Another part of the solution is Jesus. He is he's the solution. He is the solution. But according to the Holy Bible, we need each other. I didn't write it. It's like in the Bible. Yeah. See, we have this control myth. It's a manly myth. It keeps us from admitting our weakness. We do not want to admit our sin to anybody, let alone some other goober. Is anybody listening to me? Why, why? We got this manly men myth. We feel the need to put up a front that says, everything's okay. I'm good. I'm fine. Hey, hey, hey. Spend your time praying for other people, helping other people. I'm good. I'm okay. No, no, we, we have to do that. We have to put up the front because we don't want anybody messing with us saying, what's wrong with you? We don't want anybody to say, are you struggling with something particular? Well, don't ask me that. Is anybody hearing me? Oh, since you brought it up, two different people. One of them was Brother Folger. And another person said, uh... I don't know why you're talking about that coffee thing. You don't need to talk about coffee anymore. And I'll just be honest, I did not say the word coffee this morning. I'm pretty sure I said the word caffeine. <laughs> Tea's loaded with... The, but nobody gets up. I can't believe you're talking about tea. I'm, I'm hooked on tea. 
on Pepsi on Dr. Pepper. I, I, I just, sorry, it just came in my head. We feel like we need to put up a front and act like that we're okay. It's under control. And church, listen, tomorrow, if you'll go to church, tomorrow is probably the number one place we hide our truth. And some kind, interested fellow believer says, how's it going? I'm good. We're fine, man. I got it under control. Yeah. A good way to ruin our lives is to live to protect our image. I don't want anybody to know how wicked I am. I don't want anybody to know that I might have some kind of addiction. I don't have problems like you guys. Uh, people won't respect me. I'll never get invited to preach again if I told people what I'm addicted to. Hey, I ain't telling you, man. I'm not telling you. Excuse me? I'm pretty sure the Bible says, listen to what it says, Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. And you keep lying at church, keep protecting your image at church, like, I'm good. <laughs> Nothing's going on, man. I am fine. I, this church is really, I know you guys are glad I'm here. Because <laughs> at least there's one of us that's making it. Yeah. And when that one falls, have you ever heard this saying? I don't need anyone. I'm good. I don't need anyone. All I need is God. Me and God, we're, we're a full team. We don't need anybody else. Excuse me, I'm just asking, have you ever heard anybody say that? Yeah. I don't need anybody to help me. Well, I've got God. All I got to do is get on my knees and confess my sins, and He'll forgive me of my sins. I'll be cleansed of all unrighteousness. I'm right with Him. I do not need you. Excuse me, let me just say it out loud to your face. There's only one human being who ever lived on this earth that had the right to say, I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone else. I have God. And his name was Jesus. Yeah. Bill was a World War I veteran. He came home from the war and he got involved in the stock market. He became very successful, made lots and lots of money until 1929 crash. Lots of people, including Bill, lost everything. All kinds of tragedies, suicides. Devastation happened because of that. What Bill did is he chose a slower method of suicide. He chose alcohol. He began to drink so obsessively that he found himself in a hospital. A doctor said, Bill, if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. You know what Bill did? He responded to the news the only way he knew how. When he got out, he went out and got drunk. One day he received a call from an old drinking buddy named Eddie. Bill's going, oh yes, come to town, man. We'll go out and have a great time. We'll get plastered. We'll visit several bars in New York City. Eddie came to the door, and the second Bill saw him, he knew he was different. But Bill said, hey, Eddie, want a drink? And Eddie said, I don't, I don't do that anymore. He said, why? 
He said, God changed my life. So Eddie took Bill to a little group there in town that met with a minister named Frank Buckman. They called themselves the Oxford Group. The group would meet, read the Bible, pray, and hear preaching. Then they would go down to Stewart's Cafe and sit around and talk, a while, a talk about why they didn't want to do what they used to do. Bill found that, wow, I can stay sober as long as I have these guys to talk to. He was able to get employed again. And in 1935, he was, uh, his company sent him to Akron, Ohio. The business meeting that he went to didn't go good. Bill was discouraged, and depressed. And he was a long way from home and a long way from support. The lights from the bar at the hotel were calling him. Everything in him said, I need a drink. I need a drink. Bill walked up to the bar and put down a dollar bill and said, I need nickels. He got 20 nickels. Payphones back then were a nickel. He got the yellow pages and he started calling churches. Finally, he reached a pastor, Reverend Walter Tubbs, and he said, Bill said to the pastor, I need to talk to a drunk. The reverend gave him 10 names. <laughs> <laughs> he caught the first nine. He called the first nine, and no one answered. He couldn't catch anyone. When he called the 10th, the woman answered. And when he told her what he wanted, she said, come to our house. The house was a well-known, popular, well-known surgeon named Dr. Bob Smith. Now, this meeting was in Akron, Ohio. But Smith lost his practice because of drinking. Dr. Bob was drunk that night. Bill came in and explained to Bob, I'm not here to fix you tonight. I'm here to help me. I've got to talk to somebody. Dr. Bob said, I'll give you 15 minutes. They talked for six hours. In 1935, an Alcoholics Anonymous was born. That's the power of another. Two are better than one. Galatians says, Brethren, if any man be take, overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering himself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Fellas, we need help with each other. Oh, no, not me. I got this. In fact, everything's good. I don't have any addictions. We just read it. Your Bible may still be open there. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed, that you might get over this addiction. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Bill Wilson and Dr. Smith started meeting with other drunks in Ohio and New York City. They'd get together and they'd talk about their problems and they'd read scripture and they'd hear preaching. And Bill later said, hey, Bob, we need to, we ought to write these things down. All this stuff we're learning so we can help other people. So they began to write it down. In 1939, they published the basic textbook, It's 12 Steps. Now 25 million copies of Alcoholics Anonymous, big book, have been distributed. For Jesus to be our solution, we need him and the victory he provides, and we need his people the church, others on the journey to freedom. You know why these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are so helpful and so valuable? They sound a lot like the Bible. In fact, since I brought it up, they were trying to decide on a name in 1935 when they were trying to decide what is this going to be called. 
and there were only two names written down that they would vote for. It was either Alcoholics Anonymous, Anonymous or the James Club. And AA won by one vote. Why was it called the James Club? It was their favorite book to study. It was their favorite book of the Bible to help them. Look at your Bible. Look at James 1. Look at it. James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, that abradeth not, it shall be given him. Hey, fellas, stop, stop. If you've got some addiction that you will admit to, why don't you ask God? Amen? Look, look, look at one twenty-two. But if you be doers of the word and not hearers only, you're deceiving your own selves. If you hear what the Bible says and you're not willing to do it, you're not going to get over your addiction. You've got to be willing to do what the book says. Chapter 2, verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Being alone. Bubba, you just can't keep believing. One day you're going to have to put some feet to what you believe that you're going to stay away from whatever that is that's bothering you. You're going to have to practice it. James 3.13 Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Help each other and talk to each other. Chapter 4, verse 6, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Can somebody say amen? amen? Hey, Bubba, you can't come to God with how good you are and say, help me. You've got to come to God and say, I can't take it anymore. I need your help. Amen. Humble yourself before him, as it says here. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's a big, helpful verse. Chapter 4, verse 12. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? You and I don't have the right to point our finger at other people and tell them how wicked they are because you're so lousy and all that stuff. No, somebody needs to preach to you and say, hey, Bubba, you need to admit what you are. But I need, I'm honest with you folks. I'm not better than anybody in this room. I'm just as human as any other human. I'm thankful that I haven't been caught up and plugged into some things that you guys have. But I've been caught up and plugged into sin, to self. I want my way. My way is right. In fact, the Bible tells me my way is right. Every way of a man is right in his own mind. There you go. I'm right. I quote that to my wife and say, hey, woman, be quiet. I'm right. <laughs> yeah, not too good. No, 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 no. How these, these sermons exploded out of Philippians 3.21. He is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Fellas, I'm telling you, I already told you that that's talking about the second coming. He's going to change our vile body. But I'm telling you already, he's already in control right now on this planet. He can right now subdue anything, everything, right now. We don't have to wait. Whatever that is, it's got its hooks in you that's pulling on you. He can subdue all things. Do you believe him? Are you willing to humble yourself, confess to him what it is? Since you brought it up, I'll just say it to your face. I've got to be willing to confess to God and get on my knees and say, God, I can't hide it from you. You already know, but you told me to confess it and confess my addiction. Why would I do that? I know it's wrong, and he's convicted me about it. Is anybody hearing me? He's convicted me. Well, Brother Dave, I don't just, I really don't see anything wrong with the computer. Well, maybe God didn't convict you about it. Brother Dave, I just don't, I can't believe you're going to really, really, truly talk about caffeine. Well, he convicted me about it. 
Did he convict you about it? Well, don't worry about it then, crybaby. <laughs> worry about what he's convicting you about. You don't, I don't, you don't need to be judging me about whatever, and I don't need to be judging you. I just know you need to do whatever he's convicting you about. To subdue, for the Lloyd Reed made it plain. God's able to take power away from any other thing or person that stands in opposition to the desired result. I don't care if it's a person, a place, or a thing. Whatever's got its hooks in you, God's able to subdue that and remove its power so God can have his way with you. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I have five brothers. The two youngest one's names are Joel and Timmy. My brother Joel has been working with Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is like RU or like Hope. This has a different name. It's the ones that the Southern Baptist churches use. It's their name. My brother's been doing Celebrate Recovery for 10 years. You know why he, he first went, the very first year he went to Celebrate Recovery, you know why? They meet every Thursday, every, uh, every Thursday night. You know why he went? Because our brother, our baby brother, Timmy, is a meth addict. And my next to baby brother said, if I can help my brother Tim, I'm willing to go to celebrate recovery. Me and my wife will go if we can get Tim and his wife to go. And my brother Timmy and Brenda said they would go with Joel and Brett. And they went. My brother Tim, my brother Joel's heart was just bouncing with joy that maybe we can help Tim get over this addiction. Timmy went for five weeks and quit. Joel kept going and he finished the year, he finished the, the series, I think it's nine months, but they finished the work. And the pastor said, Joel, uh, you're supposed to be in charge of CR. And he goes, uh, no, I'm not. They already have a leader. I don't need to be in charge. And the pastor said, God's put it on my heart. You are supposed to be in charge. And so 10 years ago, he went to help our little brother. And 10 years passed, and he's trying to help addicted people that admit where they are. And I've never, I've never been interested in his ministry. I'm a man of God. I'm an independent Baptist. I'm not Southern Baptist. He's doing his thing. I'll do mine. He would occasionally tell testimony about what God's doing, and I'd be thankful. I talked to my brother about every, uh, at the most, two months past. We, we talk. We're not distant from each other. I don't hate him. He doesn't hate me. I just don't talk to him about his ministry. He's asked me. He's told me about things and things of burden they have and so on. Hmm. So my brother is a carpenter, the one that does CR, and uh, I ask him to help me quite often with things on projects I'm doing. And so uh, December the 7th, he was working at my daughter's house. We were remodeling some things. And he goes, hey, he said, my wife tonight, Brett, is, it was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it was December the 8th. He said, tonight she's giving her testimony at another CR group close to your house, and uh, just wanted you to know if you want to go hear it. And my brother's good to me, and so on. I go, okay, I'll come. So Nancy and I went to hear Brett's testimony. Joel and Brett got married under horrible circumstances, and it's heartbreaking and all that, but they've been together a long time now. They have two grown kids, and, and God's, God doesn't throw you away because you mess up. So I never heard Brett's testimony. I only see her at Christmas and Thanksgiving, occasionally something else, but I don't fellowship with her, talk to her. I don't know anything about her. 
So I sit there as Brett gives her testimony. And I learn things about her that I never knew. And I mentioned to you this morning that she mentioned one of her addictions was anger. I thought, I never heard of that, and I told you about that. After Brett got done, uh, they do some other things. And then whoever is the leader of CR, they, uh, they have uh, chips up front. And whoever's leader holds up this blue chip and says, uh, this blue chip is the first step of CR. It's the most important one. It's the most important one because this means you've made a decision to start. You know what your addiction is. You know what you're going through. You know what's wrong. But you've made a decision to admit it and to start. It's the most important one. I'm sitting in a room with about 15, 18 people. My wife's beside me. When they ask, anybody want to come and get a blue one? This is the most important chip. I was under conviction just like I was at any Holy Ghost revival. God was convicting me and I said, I'm not going to go get a chip. I'm not part of this CR group and I'm never coming back. I'll just make the decision in my seat. And I did. That was on Tuesday. We had to work all week long on my daughter's house. And on Thursday, my brother said, Dave, tonight, Timmy's wife is going to give a testimony. It's her first time to give a testimony in public. They have to write every word down in their testimony. And it has to be between 30, 20 and 30 minutes. It can't be like a five minute little deal. You got to tell your life and your heart. And you have to write it down because they don't want you saying all kinds of other stuff. They want you to say what's written down. I didn't know all that, but I said, well, I should go. And I went to hear my sister-in-law, Brenda, give her testimony. Now I'll back up a step and tell you that Brenda and Timmy went 10 years ago for five weeks and quit. Three and a half years ago, my brother Tim, by God's grace and kindness, said he's going to go back. And he asked his wife to go with him. She said, I'm not going back with you. I know who you are. I know what you're like. You're going to go for a few weeks. You're going to get, and then you're going to do what you do. I'm not going. And so she said to him, if you go and don't miss one, one meeting for four months, she said, I'll go with you. So Tim's been going for three and a half years, and Brenda's been going for three years. She gives her testimony when she gets done. My brother Joel stands up in front of the group and says, anybody need to come and get a blue chip? This means you're going to start. It means you admit where you are, and it means you're going to start. It's the most important chip. Anybody going to come and get a blue chip? Now I need to back up and tell you, fellows, the blue chip is not just for the first timer like me. It might be that someone like my brother Tim that's been there three years. But some other thing is in his life. Or he's messed up in an area of his life. And you just don't go, I already got the blue chip. No, 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 no. You got to start over. And get another blue chip for whatever this is. Everybody hearing me? And my brother Timmy, his favorite line to me of late is, there's no shame in coming back. There's no shame in getting another blue chip. At least you're starting. On Thursday night, December the 10th, I was under conviction so much, just like I was on Tuesday. I got up out of my seat. And I got a chip to say, okay, God, I admit where I am and I'm going to start. 
Everybody hearing me? I've only been to two other CR meetings. I travel full time. But occasionally when I'm home and there's opportunity, I'll go sit with my brother on a Thursday night. And there's been time that God's convicted me and I need to go get a blue chip. No, no, I've got the yellow one and the green one and the blue one, or not the blue, the red one, and the gold one. I've, I've got those and I'm thankful. But the most important chip is that you've got to start. What I've scattered out underneath these two speakers and these two boxes here, I've got some of these blue chips. There are some chains if you need a chain. Some people put it on their key ring. There's some guys in this room right now, they have them taped on the back of their phone. They see it all the time. Some of you in this room need to start. He's able. You don't do it on your own. He's able. But you have to start. I ask you to stand with me. Please look up here. Please look up here. I want to read you my brother Timmy's prayer. He's a meth head. He's been clean now for three years and three months. First of all, I'm going to read you two short things Timmy said. Timmy said, addiction is when you give up everything for one thing. And that one thing cannot satisfy completely. It leaves a hole. We keep trying to fill the hole with that thing that cannot satisfy. Only in recovery do we give up one thing, the addiction for everything, which is God. He fills the hole. His prayer is, God, please open all the doors of my heart that I've kept closed and locked for all these years, that I might truly have a relationship with you. God, I am who you say that I am, not who others say that I am or that I think that I am. Thank you. In your mighty and holy name I pray. I'd like to pray with you, our great God, I sure love you, and I'm thankful for help. I'm thankful for truth. I'm thankful you're able to subdue all things. God, we cannot, I know I cannot do this on my own. I know it's not just me and you. You gave us a family of brothers and sisters that can help us. We can pray for one another. I pray today that as you convince us and you convict us that today that we'll be honest, we'll humble ourselves, and today we're going to start.